I want to tell you a story. Let's see my slides should come up. Reinventing batteries. I think Scott intentionally put my talk last because from Laura, your talk to Martin's talk is what 10 orders of magnitude and land scale difference. From Martin to me, another 10 at least orders of magnitude. I go, it's crazy, right before Christmas, right? You send people out to the universe and then you bring them back, ask them to zoom in. That's what the Scott has uh, pl been plotting. So I want to tell you about reinventing batteries. Um, this is an area, I've been here for 18 years, 19 years now. Ken was in such committee to hire me. If you still remember my proposal, nothing is in, in my proposal. So Stanford is such an amazing place. I come in, want to do something I have no idea about, and then I can still recruit students to join in my lab to start that research field. That's just incredible, amazing. Um, so now this is very clear, two major driving force for batteries. Top one is sustainable mobility. We see electric car, we might have electric plane down the road, so that's a cartoon drawing, it's not real. <laughs> uh, certainly, stationary storage is another driving force for in integrating electricity, clean electricity, solar and wind into electric grid, provide resilience. So these two have been driving battery innovation. So through 2019, you have seen uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given to development of lithium ion batteries. Then you ask the question, so what are the grand challenges still remaining? Oftentimes, Nobel Prize is giving that's telling you, you know, game finished, right? But this is not the case. This game just started. First question we asked, how much more energy can you store per unit weight or volume? And can we double or maybe quadruple the amount of energy you store per weight? then your electric car can go four times longer distance or the battery pack size becomes half or less. Second one we ask for sustainability, you know your battery usually is about a thousand cycle in your cell phone. Can you go an order of humanity a longer life? Instead of five years, can you go to 30 years? Right? Then you don't need to produce so many batteries to replace. This has a huge meaning on sustainability. Next one is fast charging. 10 minutes, five minutes, can we do it? What's the material science and chemistry limiting that? We try to figure that out. And coming out a solution as well. Safety. The reason I have not installed the batteries, uh, energy storage for my house yet, I worry about burning down my house. For car, I'm okay. So if I crawl out fast enough, I think I'm still fine. The cost as well, well, to go to global, globally, you know, everybody using clean electricity, you know, electrified transportation, we are look, really looking into can we really get down to 10x lower cost. That means roughly $10 per kilowatt hour, roughly. Next one is, hey, we need billions tons of materials. Do we have these materials available? How do we enable material circularity? So all these questions, as now accelerator director, I see a destination right there, where to go. We need to come back to invent the science to do it. So, well, this the huge program now, uh, up to today, we try to answer all these questions, but let me pick a few questions we try to answer. First one is, uh, how do you store a lot more energy? Well, let's look in graphite. Graphite is used to store lithium. That tiny ball right there going in is through intercalation to store between the graphene layers. This gives you roughly 300 milliamp hour per gram of charge storage capacity. But we do have material that can store a lot more, 10 times more. Silicon can do 4,200. Lithium, metallic lithium, close, also close to 4,000. Why don't we use the new material? If you can store a lot more charges like lithium, you increase the amount of energy you store tremendously. 
from the cathode side, similar, the top three cathodes are the basic structures for the lithium ion batteries. Lithium copper oxide, lithium manganese oxide, lithium ion phosphate. They store somewhere close to 200 milliamp per gram, but we have something that can store a lot more, sulfur. And the cost is very low as well if you do sulfur. But this gives you 1,700 milliamp per gram. So this is a question we asked. When I started at Stanford, of course, I know nothing about battery. I didn't work on electrochemistry at all. Well, I look into this problem further, and the, also the opportunity, let me mention the opportunity as well. If we could make silicon to work, we could make lithium metal to work and sulfur to work, we have a runway. Compared to current technology, 250 watt per kilo, you can double, you can quadruple the amount of energy you could store. But the biggest challenge really come, right hand side are the new materials. First of all, you st store so many lithium ions, so many charges, you break a chemical bond for those materials for, for storing lithium ions. The atoms of those materials move to very long distance. You lose control and complete structure change, gigantic volume expansion compared to the left hand side traditional materials. So in the battery field, nobody knows how to handle this. Right? This requires you to design your material from atomic scale, nano scale, all the way to the whole electro, the cell scale. So there's a huge period of shift right here in order for you to enable those new materials. Let me show you the first example my lab worked on since I joined the faculty, silicon. Silicon store a lot more lithium, but its volume expansion is gigantic. It's about four times once lithium coming in. And it's going to break the silicon particles. It's going to make the surface, the interface, each of these particle interface with electrolyte not stable. So nobody knew how to solve this problem. I also didn't know how challenging this problem is, but I started anyway. So I still remember one night email my student. I said, hey, Candice, I have a new ideas. Uh, by making these structures small enough, they just don't break anymore. So that's the starting point I learned about of solid mechanics a little bit from my colleague. So we indeed, uh, uh, in a way, the first idea of growing silicon wire for metallic foil. So electrons can moving in and out, lithium ion can coming in and out. And as a first demonstration, turned out to be this idea solved the problem. So this was the actually starting first paper we published in the battery field. Turned out to be, this is all the, also the paper, opened out the whole new field. Oftentimes, I look at the citation, I know how, how big the field growth, big, depending on this paper size citation, because this is the first paper. And then to understand this, we need a tool to really look into this. Well, when I joined Stanford, our electron micro microscope was not so good at all. Thank you, Ken, for leading up this whole facility. You know, we have this electron microscope keeps coming. And this is the one we, we, you know, we use our, using the Titan and built this a tiny nano pro having a single nano structure in there. And, and then this can be, you build a single nano structure battery, you can charge and discharge, you watch what happened. And I want to show you a video. This is 200 nanometer scale bar right here. So this nano wide diameter is about a thousand times smaller than your hair in diameter. So if you charge it up, you see this nano wire expand a lot with this black color coating that's copper, it's broken. This expansion is so powerful. It actually breaks this uh, coating. And, but the diameter of the wire is small enough, they do not break anymore. So we use a tool like this, working with, uh, in collaboration with Bill Nix. Uh, I learned so much from him about the mechanical property or materials. Um, and also my student, Matt Mattel, now a faculty member in Georgia Tech. So if you look at the center particle right there, diameter is about 800 nanometers. It's just too big. It cannot take this uh, volume expansion as much. Pretty soon you are going to see, once lithium coming in, this expansion keeps happening, eventually it will be broken. Um, 
once it's broken, materials lose connection with each other, and then your capacity is gone. So basically, silicon had, was, was the case. The first time you charge all your batteries, it's already died, right? Then it doesn't work. So you need to avoid this breaking. So we use, utilizing these two, we actually identify the size, scaling law, how small you need to make this particle in order to avoid breaking. Turn out to be about 150 nanometer. So over the years, we designed multi-generation. I won't bother you with all the details, but by, we want to solve interfacial instability issue. We want to you know, decrease the surface area in, instead of increase the surface, surface area. How do you design the materials to solve those uh, problem? So, and, uh, and this leads to uh, uh, formation of this company. Empress in 2008, but I can share with you, I was starting our company and make it go towards the way you can generate the real product. It's very, very challenging. And, and there's a two value of death right there. And uh, there's a huge amount of investment needed. And uh, so I'm glad to see Empress product is now on, in the market. So what's next to increase the energy density? This is holy grail. It's actually metallic lithium anode. If you look at 1970s, 80s, when people try to work on lithium batteries, they didn't plan to use graphite to store lithium for the anode. It was actually metallic lithium. But there's so many bad things happen to metallic lithium. During plating and stripping, when you charge out your battery, you're going to plate lithium, become thicker and thicker. Because it's a plating process, it's metallic from this dendritic structure. You lose control. Dendrity structure can go to the other side. That's cathode. Cause battery shorting. Cause battery catching fire. So in early 1980s, there was a startup company commercializing lithium metal technology because of catching fires. So nobody dare to touch metallic lithium anymore. So not until 1991, when Sony came along to commercialize the first lithium ion battery using graphite as the anode. But graphite, people have used its full potential. You need to look into new materials, so that's why we're looking into silicon. Eventually, metallic lithium gives you the final destination. Again, destination here. Um, so it's so hard, but we have to uh, come up with new idea for doing that. So in order to solve this uh, volume expansion, uncontrolled morphology change, when Steve came back in 2013 from uh, the Department of Energy, he and I actually brainstormed about how do we solve this problem. The first idea we come up is to building a stable nanoscale host, hosting lithium deposition inside so they don't go everywhere. So we, we offer a seeded approach to control lithium nucleation inside a hollow carbon structure. Also control lithium nucleation and growth between the graphene oxide layer. So that has pro provided quite exciting progress towards solving this problem. But that's not sufficient. With Jenambao and Jen, we have been now designing stable electrolyte that can form stable interfacial layer. So these, uh, we utilize certainly the, the most uh, you know, common concept in organic chemistry. Jenan is expert on this. How do we build up the stereo effect, electronic effect to make your molecule stable? so they don't get consumed by uh, lithium uh, that much. So in the last minute, let me also share with you, this is super important, and I have the top 10 list of a technology we really need, right, for clean energy transition. Long duration energy storage is uh, uh, really far, you know, on, on priority in the list. And to look into long duration energy storage problem, the cost needs to be low. The lifetime needs to be very long. It's better if you build it. It needs to be recycled and reused easily. So remember one day brainstorm with my student. I said, well, let's open periodic table and look at last 160 years. What's the most robust electrochemistry we could invent? So we actually reached the conclusion. Hydrogen become water as anode. It's not for fuel cell as a battery, but cathode is nickel hydroxide, oxyhydroxide. This gives you very long lifetime. 
potassium hydroxide solution will be very safe. It's not organic solution. So we actually invented this chemistry. As soon as I invented this, I get so excited. And then we start to look into literature and find out, well, this is the forgotten chemistry. Actually, NASA has been, use, have been using this for 30 years. And Hubble telescope, 30 years, trouble free. This gave me a lot of confidence. This is very robust chemistry. But the NASA technology used platinum as catalyst, too expensive. So we replaced, we replaced cat, uh, a platinum and invented this new catalyst, nickel molybdenum cobalt. And it works really well. And the cost is reduced by 10,000 times, now becomes civilian use. And we show this is very long life, so I won't bother you with all this data. And not only that, so nickel is still not the lowest cost materials. If you want to go to scale, gigaton, 100 terawatt hour, we need lower cost, more abundant materials. We look into manganese, lead, and iron. So, so far we made manganese, hydrogen, gas battery to work, lead hydrogen uh, gas uh, battery to work, but we haven't figured out the iron yet. If we figure out the iron, the cost will be extremely low. So this is the manganese one, so we make it to work. Uh, three and a half years ago, I, I, I spun out another company in Avano. So in Avano is doing a great job now delivering the, uh, actually the shipping container or product to customers. Uh, with that, I just want to, uh, thank the whole research group and also certainly over the years uh, different funding sources to support this research. Let me emphasize one thing right here. When I joined faculty, I was not able to raise money at all because nobody worked on battery at the time. I was having trouble as a young assistant professor to raise money. Global Climate Energy Project, GSAP, was the first one and, and inside, right, in the nation to offer me uh, funding to get my research uh, group going. I was remembering, you know, in the summer time, my startup it was about to run out. I start to have nightmare how to pay graduate students. Three months later, just that money coming in to save the group. And, and then after that, so the whole research field explode, you know, many, a lot of other resources coming in. So that's the story I want to share with you. Internally in door school, this is my feeling, Arun. So a lot of internal resources probably help supporting amazing idea from our faculty, particularly young faculty, and to providing the resources to get to the, the stage to get, they can explore outside support. There will be a huge impact on campus right here. Thank you very much. Thank you.